ability to go on this trip in March of 2020. Um, she had asked me if I would be able to possibly help out with the kids for a couple of nights while she was gone. And what was the plan concerning you watching the children? Um, well, they were in daycare at the time. I think the boys were, and I think their daughter, I don't, it was COVID, so I don't really know where they were during the day, but I was at work. Um, and then I would be there for the kids in the evening for dinner, bedtime, um, and then get them off to where they needed to be in the morning before I went to work. And it was a Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday, I was going to have the kids go with her um, stepmom and dad. And what was the plan, to your knowledge, of whether or not the defendant was supposed to be present for any of that? He was not going to be. He was actually out of state, was my understanding. So I'm going to direct your attention to the early morning hours of March 5th of 2020. Um, do you recall something that caused you concern on that morning? Yeah. And what was that? Um, I had fallen asleep in the living room on the couch. And when I had woke up, there was the lights were off. I think the TV was in sleep mode, and um, I saw a dark figure at the end of the couch. Um, and then when I, I don't know if I moved or made a sound or whatnot, but where my feet were, there was. Judge, I'm going to object on the grounds of relevance and other acts. Um, and if, if this needs to be argued further, I'd like it to be outside the presence of the jury. Um, well, let's. You, uh, I'm going to at this point. Uh, overrule the objection. Go ahead. So what happened when you saw the figure at the end of the couch? Um, like I said, I don't know if I moved or made a sound, but the lights went on, and um, the defendant was standing at the end of the couch just smiling at me and said, hey there. Um, and I didn't really even know what to say, and so then he said, where the fuck are my kids and their whore mother? Um, and he went upstairs and woke up the kids. And do you recall roughly what time of morning this was? Um, it was about quarter to four in the morning. And where were you staying that night that the defendant was in the living room? In Sadie's home. And to your knowledge, did the defendant live there? No, he did not. To your knowledge, was he supposed to be there? No. After the defendant went upstairs to wake up the children, what do you recall happening next? Um, he came back down with the kids um, and stood there and started asking me. He actually had told me that he was surprised I was there because he thought I was be down in Mexico whoring with her when he saw my Jeep in the driveway. Um, and then he asked me again who she was with, and I told him the people who he also knows. Um, and he told me not to lie and that he knows she's fucking somebody whose name starts with an L. Now, at this point, given your friendship with Ms. Beecham, are you aware of anyone in her life at that point whose name or nickname started with an L? Yeah. And who is that? Rosalio. Um, we actually called him Leo because when she first told me his name, I'm kind of hard of hearing, and so I was like, I didn't understand what she said, so we started, like, made a joke that we would call him Leo, and that's, for a while, that's how she referred to him whenever she would speak to me about him. And prior to this March 5th incident you're talking about, approximately how long before that did you first hear about this Leo? Um, I want to say maybe late January, early February, she kind of started talking about this guy that she was kind of chatting with, um, and I don't know for sure if that was when, but I remember like closer to Valentine's Day, um, she really started to talk more about him than, you know, she had in the weeks prior. Now back to March 5th of 2020, after, uh, I think the defendant said the thing about thinking that you'd be in Mexico, what happened next? after he came back down with the kids, you mean? Yes. Um, I remember I had contacted Sadie and 911 was called um, and he was in the kitchen making breakfast and telling them to hurry up and eat because um, Auntie Becky says I'm a bad man and the cops are coming. And was this still roughly around 4 a.m.? It was around, yeah. I mean, the, when I looked at the clock, it was about, for the first time that I remember looking, it was about 3.45 in the morning 
according to the clock in the living room. And who had been the one to call 911? Sadie did. And why, in, you, in your understanding, was that done? Uh, because I contacted her and I let her no know. No object as far as speculation as to why Ms. Beecham called 911. Your Honor, I believe she's saying what she stated to Ms. Beecham, which I believe she will then represent is why she believes 911 was called. It's all about her statements to Ms. Beecham. All what? It's all about her statements to Ms. Beecham about the situation. So it's it's not hearsay because she's going to provide it. And Ms. Beecham has testified yeah. had been crossed. Overall. Um, so I had contacted her and I just said, what the hell, Zach is here? Like, w what is he doing here? And I didn't know what to do. Um, I, I was terrified. I didn't know why he was there. My understanding, he wasn't supposed to be there. And she proceeded to call 911 because if she hadn't, I told her I would. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 282. phone calls you referenced between yourself and Ms. Beecham on March 5th of 2020, starting at 3.56 a.m.? Yes. And then ultimately culminating with one at 10.43 a.m.? Yes. Now, in reference to Ms. Beecham's relationship with someone you knew to be named Leo. Um, you had indicated that the ending of the defendant and Ms. Beecham's relationship was around Christmas of 2019. Was Leo the first person that you were aware of that Sadie had shown any interest in? Yeah, he was. And being her friend of 30 years, were you privy to how that relationship was going starting in February of 2020? Yeah, I was. Now, did you ever meet Leo in person? Unfortunately, I did not um, with COVID, um, but I did have an opportunity. Um, he was at her house um, decorating for their daughter's birthday. And we had like a Facebook, it was Facebook Messenger, um, like a video call that night. Um, we talked with them for quite a long time and got to know him a little bit um, and then a couple times like if she had been on the phone with him and she was with me you know she'd put it on speaker so he could say hello but I never actually got to meet him face to face no now being a friend of Miss Beecham's for for this long period of time uh, did she confide in you about her problems regarding the defendant she did and what in general do you remember being complaints that she was making in April and May of 2020 regarding the defendant towards her? Um, she was just the text messages, um, constant text messages and emails um, showing up in places or just kind of sometimes he would go radio silent and then out of nowhere just send her really random messages um, just very I don't I, I don't even know how to explain it it was just a lot of um, instances that she had told me about of weird things happening um, and then him kind of confirming it to her when she would call him out on it and at any point in April and May of 2020 did Miss Beecham indicate to you any interest in rekindling her uh, relationship with the defendant? No. And how would you describe the trajectory of Miss Beecham's relationship with Leo during those same months? Were they still seeing each other? How was that going? They were still talking. Um, she seemed very happy, um, excited. <laughs> 